Thank you that we're here together this morning at Cascadia Church. Thank you, God, that you love us and you love all your children. I know that you're pleased that around the world, billions have gathered for worship. We pray, God, that uh, your church would grow today spiritually stronger, numerically larger, that uh, everywhere where your family is meeting, your children are gathered, uh, that there would be joy and celebration and new life and uh, greater appreciation and devotion to you, Father, that individuals, large groups, we become more like Jesus Christ. That's our desire here at Cascadia Church this morning as well. We are grateful that we get to uh, continue on in our series, uh, working through the Bible a book at a time. And today as we look at the book of Jude, again, it's short, but it's condensed and it's loaded, it's saturated with super important information. So we want to know what Jude is saying to us uh, because of what he said to uh, the first century church and some challenges they were facing. Ours really are no different. They're just a little different in the way they look and sometimes how they sound. So uh, Father, help us to be attentive this morning. Help us to listen to the voice of your spirit who is our truly our teacher and our guide this morning. Thank you for his presence among us today. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. All right. Uh, We are in the book of Jude, so uh, we're going to continue on in that way here in Route 66. Uh, Next week will be the final book, Revelation. We're going to do Revelation in 30 minutes. So uh, we're looking forward to finishing up that series. And then next week, I'll introduce what our new series will be. Some of you know the name Yogi Berra. Not the cartoon character, but the catcher for the New York Yankees. And he is well known for a lot of his clever one-liners and so forth. One of the things that Yogi uh, used to say was, when you come to a fork in the road, take it. Some of you need to think about that. Some of you need to process that. But Jude, in writing his letter that we're looking at this morning, with... Uh, parchment laid down and a quill in his hand, ready to write. He came to a writing fork in the road. And he made to make, needed to make a decision. He intended to go this way, but the Spirit of God within him prompted him to go a different direction instead. His original intent was to write to the church about our commonly shared faith in Jesus Christ. And he just wanted to encourage believers in terms of what it means to know Jesus and to live with him. I think it's rather interesting because Jude was the half-brother of Jesus. And so was James. We looked at the book of James recently. So James and Jude were full brothers, but Jesus was their half-brother. Of course, God being the father of Jesus and then Joseph being the father of Jude and James and others as well. So here's... Here's how Jude began. Beloved, while I was making every effort to write to you about, to write you about our common salvation, I felt the necessity to write you appealing that you contend earnestly for the faith. So he has changed his mind. He was going to go one direction, now he's going in a different direction, and he tells us why. Verse 4, certain people have crept in unnoticed, crept into the church. People who came in under a cover of deceit or deception. Their, their motives for showing up and becoming a part of a, of a local assembly was impure. And they had ulterior motives, and Jude is calling them out. So what specifically was the problem? He says, they turned the grace of our God into indecent behavior and deny our only master and Lord Jesus Christ. So these men were penetrating the church to gain power and control, to assert their authority over others, and to twist and distort the truth of God for their own gain. We've seen this several times in these final letters uh, in 1st, 2nd, 3rd John. It's here again in Jude as well. And Jude wants to make known that this kind of behavior, not only in the 1st century, but even here in the 21st century, Uh, does not go unnoticed or unpunished by God. Here's what he said, uh, and we're going to find that in just a few moments as we work through this short little letter that we call Jude. But beforehand, before we do that, we want to do these 
simple summary introductions uh, to the book of Jude. So every week when we're in Route 66, uh, there's a 10-word or less summary of the book that we're looking at. For Jude, it is beware of heretical or false teachers and their dangerous doctrines. That's the whole point of the letter from Jude. The theme of the book is to contend for the faith. And it comes directly, of course, from a key verse in the book of Jude, verse 3. Contend earnestly for the faith. We're going to unpack that in just a few moments, a little bit more for us to get, a, us to get an understanding of what's happening there. So every week we also have a, a graphic that we look at that is a visual summary of the book. Here we have this guy, and he's, uh, he's doing judo. So you remember Jude, okay? And he's contending, he's wrestling because he has his eyes on the prize. And what's the prize? The faith. So he's contending earnestly for the faith. That's the prize. That's what he wants. Uh, and so that's the summary, a visual summary of the book of Jude. You'll never forget it, okay? I hope not, because if you do, you have to come back and look at it again, and you don't want to go there. Next time. All right, let's jump into Jude. Let's take a look at it. Just two points this morning for us. Number one is this. God always condemns ungodliness. God always condemns ungodliness. Verse 4. Certain people have crept in unnoticed. We saw that already. <clears throat> Those who were long beforehand marked out for this condemnation. Ungodly persons who turn the grace of our God into indecent behavior. It's like polar opposites and deny our only master and Lord, Jesus Christ. Ultimately, you just look, first of all, this verse is just kind of saturated with ungodliness. <clears throat> it's everywhere. But ultimately, ungodly behavior, as we have seen before a few times in some of these short little letters we've been looking at, is rooted in the denial of the authority of Jesus Christ. That's the bottom line. And Jude is saying that God sees what happens when this happens. And he's dealt with it in the past rather severely. And he will deal with it today. And he will deal with it again in the future. So it doesn't go unnoticed by God. Sometimes when we are mistreated, people treat us harshly or unfairly or whatever it might be in an ungodly or in an unbiblical way. We sometimes want the whole world to know about it, and sometimes they should, but often it's important to remember that God knows, and sometimes that's enough. God knows. And trust him to follow through and be God and do what he says he's going to do, and that comes out quite a bit here in the, in the letter from Jude. Verse 5. The Lord, he's saying, now Jude is going to give examples of how God is aware of spiritual rebellion, and he dealt with it decisively when it occurred. So here's the first example, verse 5. The Lord, after saving a people out of the land of Egypt, subsequently destroyed those who did not believe. Now, one would think that after having been freed from, freed from, freed from, slavery, freed from slavery, I need more coffee is what I need. Freed from slavery, you think that they would have remained loyal to God. All these miracles they saw, the plagues, the parting of the Red Sea, and so many other kinds of miracles, the, the physical manifestation of God's presence symbolized through the pillar of fire and the, and the column of smoke, uh, and so many of the manna and the quail, and all these kinds of miracles that God had performed for them. However, Jude says that there were some who even in, after having witnessed and experienced all that firsthand, still did not believe. They rebelled against God. And they were quite aggressive in their rebellion at times. And when we read through the book of Exodus, where this account is recorded in the Old Testament, uh, we see that in every case where there was spiritual rebellion, people died without exception. God killed them. And it was making a very strong case that this is intolerable. This is not, we're not going to tolerate spiritual rebellion among God's people. 
Now, today, God is, for a different reason, uh, more patient. And he gives people opportunities to turn from their rebellion. (laughs) If not, I wonder how many people will be left in our country. I don't know if there'd be anybody left. I would be one of them, perhaps, that would be gone. So God is patient, the scripture says, not willing that any would perish, but that all would come to repentance. God is giving time for people to come to Christ, and that's why he is patient. And so God gives people uh, opportunity to turn from their rebellion, and if they don't, there are serious spiritual consequences that are eternal, and people cannot escape from that consequence. The scripture also says it's appointed unto each one of us once to die, and then comes the judgment. There's no second chance after death. Your spiritual condition at the time of death is where you will spend eternity. God doesn't give a mulligan. Is that a proper use of that term, mulligan? It's a golfing term, so I suppose. Okay. Are you familiar with that term, Lonnie? Are you familiar with that term quite well? Okay. Okay, very good. Just wanted to make sure. All right. So there's the first example of how uh, God is aware of rebellion and deals with it. Here's another one. Verse 6. Angels who did not keep their own domain but abandoned their proper dwelling place, these he has kept in eternal restraints under darkness for the judgment of the great day. There's a lot of language here. It's It's a loaded verse. Uh, There's a lot of information here, but the point that he's making is that there are angels who have rebelled against God. They're called demons. And they are now being held in a spiritual prison in eternal restraints because of their spiritual rebellion against the Lord. And verse 7 makes clear what that spiritual rebellion looked like. We know that initially they were cast out of heaven when Lucifer decided that God was sitting in his place and he tried to overthrow the authority in the kingdom of, in, 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 you know, the, the reign of God and he was ejected and a third of the angels rebelled with Lucifer and they were now, they're now called demons or evil spirits. So what does this rebellion look like? What does it mean when they did not keep their own domain but abandoned their proper dwelling place? We read the next verse and it makes it clear for us. So here's what verse 7 says, continuing on. Just as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them, since they, notice this, in the same way as these angels, the people in Sodom and Gomorrah did the very same thing these angels did. What did they do? They indulged in sexual perversion. How'd they do that? They went after strange flesh. And, uh, and they're exhibited as an example and undergoing the punishment of eternal fire. So Sodom and Gomorrah was destroyed by brimstone and archaeologists have found sulfur balls from in those locations. And you can still light it up and it can still burn those, those kinds of things. But the point here is the same kind of sexual sin of which Sodom and Gomorrah was guilty, so were the angels in verse 6. So these angels left their own domain, and it says they they indulged in sexual perversion and went after strange flesh. I'm just going to put this out there because this is what it means. Very unpopular today. But for, for the angels, they had sexual intercourse with humans. And in Sodom and Gomorrah, it was homosexuality. It's right there in Genesis 19. It gives all the information there about that. God is aware, and God uh, is giving people an opportunity to turn away from any kind of sexual perversion. Uh, There are consequences to come if people do not turn from what the Bible says is ungodly. And in our culture today, it's being labeled as normal. And from God's value system, ungodliness is not normal. Uh, it's, there are consequences for it, and God always condemns it. Perhaps we'll talk about that more during flock talk. So Jude is tying the past sexual sins of Sodom and Gomorrah and these angels to his day. 
He's saying this same kind of problem is going on today in Jude's day, and it's still going on uh, even to this day. We go to verse 8. Notice this. In the same way, he continues on with this thread of sexual perversion. In the same way, these people also, which people? The ones who crept into the church unnoticed and are twisting and distorting the word of God to their own advantage. A lot of the the drive behind that is sexual deviancy. And you hear and read and discover about spiritual leaders all the time. Their sexual sin is finally exposed. Why? Because God's aware of it and God's going to deal with it. Then it needs to be exposed. And those who are guilty of this kind of sin should no longer be in the ministry. They should be out. Sadly, some churches say, you know, well, we'll give you a, a, a year sabbatical and give you a chance to, to kind of cool down a little bit and then we'll bring you back in. No, that's not what the word of God says. So in the same way, these people also dreaming defile the flesh. So I have the idea of dreaming is that they, they are thinking on their own apart from the revelation of God. And the idea is that they're dreaming up creative ways of sinning. That's what he's getting at here in Jude. They're discovering new and new ways to be perverted. It still continues in our day. And they defile the flesh. They defile the flesh. Jesus said there are a number of things that defile the flesh. We read uh, in Matthew chapter 15, verses 18 and 19, he said, the things that come out of the mouth come from the heart. For those things defile the person. It's what you do. It's what you say. And the the point Jesus is making is he was being criticized for what he and his disciples were eating. And Jesus said, it's not what you put into your mouth that defiles you. It's what comes out of your mouth. He said, for out of the heart come evil thoughts, murders, acts of adultery, other immoral sexual acts, thefts, false testimonies, and slanderous statements. Boy, this is just, this kind of stuff saturates our culture. And it often saturates so-called churches. And Jesus said, these are the things that defile a person. These are the things. And then we go back to verse 8, looking again, those who are dreaming, they come up with these creative ways of sinning, and one of them is they defile the flesh, and the other one is they reject authority. We were, learned recently in Third John about a man named Diotrephes and others who demonstrate a classic mark of false teaching, which is this, that their will and their word is superior to all others, including God's. God's word, God's will, maybe not even secondary, but what is primary for a false teacher is his own will and his own word that overrules all other authority. And that's what's happening here in what Jude is writing. It is a, it's a classic mark of a false teacher. You know, they'll be talking about something and then they'll say something and you go, that it just doesn't sound right. And some will be discerning enough to check the scriptures. Others will be careless and a little slack and say, yeah, but he's the pastor. He went to school. He went to seminary. He's got these degrees. He's got this training, got these experiences. It's a little weird, but I'm going to trust him on this one. Dangerous. No, you check the scriptures. That is the authority. That's the authority. And then we look here, this third way uh, that, that godliness is manifested by these false teachers, these heretics, is they speak abusively of angelic majesties. And I'm looking at, I was looking at that this week trying to figure out what does this mean? And I, I dove and I dug around and looked and looked. And then I read the next verse, <laughs> which is always a good idea. And it just made it very clear. Made it very clear. But Michael the archangel. So we look back at these who are speaking abusively of angelic majesties, and then he uses Michael the archangel as a contrast. 
But on the other hand, Michael, who was different, he handled it differently. When he disputed with the devil and argued about the body of Moses, did not dare pronounce against him an abusive judgment, but said, the Lord rebuke you. So this abusive judgment is in contrast to speaking abusively that the false teachers are doing. Do you see the contrast there? And so the point that he's making is that these troublemakers of whom Jude was writing, they had no respect uh, for uh, God. They had no respect for angels. They had no respect for humans. They were spiritually abusing God. They were spiritually abusing his word. They were spiritually abusing angels, so to speak, and, and literally, and they were spiritually abusing people. All of that is because they had no respect for any kind of spiritual authority other than their own. They didn't learn from God's written word. They didn't learn from the examples of Michael the archangel or others. This is what godliness looks like. They just said they're just going to go their own way and they're going to do their own thing. As I said, no respect for God, for his word, for angels, for humans. The only ones in the mind of a false teacher or a heretic. The only one who respects, who deserves respect is themselves. Those are the ones that deserve respect. And they demand it. So the point that Jude is making for us is that God sees this. And God's going to judge this. He sees what I'm doing. He sees what you're doing. He knows it. He knows everything. We can't hide anything from him. He knows our hearts. He knows our motives. And we want to take comfort in knowing this, that if you know Jesus... Uh, your wrongdoings and my wrongdoings have already been judged at the cross. And eternally, uh, there are no consequences. But that does not mean that there will not be consequences in this life. For example, you you get a speeding ticket, you're going to pay a fine. You know, God can forgive you for that ticket, but he's not necessarily going to pay it for you. There's a consequence for wrongdoing. And eternally, though, we are secure because we have been forgiven. And so Jude illustrates this principle, that there is always a consequence in this life and in the life to come for sins that we commit. And we're not going to take the time to look into it, but if you on your own want to look at verses 10 through 16, he gives examples of others who face the consequences of their sin. He mentions Cain, who murdered his brother Abel. He mentions Balaam, who was bribed to prophesy against God's people. You read about Korah, who led a rebellion against the leadership and the authority of Moses. And these are all spiritually rebellious people who paid a price for their spiritual rebellion. And Jude's calling them out. And he's warning, warning his readers uh, that God is aware of everything and he's going to deal with spiritual rebellion. He's pushing us away from that. So one more verse before we move quickly to the second and final point this morning is verse 14. Behold, the Lord has come with many thousands of his holy ones to execute judgment upon all. Notice this and to convict all the ungodly of their ungodly deeds, which they have done in an ungodly way, and all the harsh things which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. You see the theme there, obviously? God always condemns ungodliness. He hates it. He's not just going to let it go like, yeah, it's no big deal, you know, whatever. That's it. I understand, I get it. You know, that's not God's attitude at all. He hates it, and he judges it. But he's patient and merciful and gives us an opportunity to to turn from our ungodliness through Jesus Christ and be redeemed, be forgiven, and have a new life. So this day is coming. And Jude and I are both warning you, as I just did a moment ago, about turning from ungodliness, turning from sin, and learning to live God's way. So the big question, the $64,000 question, is how? How do we do that? How do we learn to live in a godly way? That's the second half of the book, and we're going to look at it right now. We must always contend faithfully. 
We must always contend faithfully. And that's a key verse for the book. Contend earnestly for the faith that was once for all time handed down to the saints. That's you and me. We are the saints. We are the church. We're God's family. This, this phrase here, contend earnestly, it means to strenuously agonize. You have to work at it. You have to be focused. You have to be disciplined. You have to be faithful. And in the final verses we're going to look at, just we're going to look at it real quickly here. Jude brings out three things that we have to do. Three things, three commands that we have to fulfill uh, if we are going to, actually, I think there might be just two. We'll find out in just a moment here. Uh, and they're introduced with this little phrase, but you, beloved. See, he starts out by talking about these, these ungodly people. And then he flips it. Then he says, but you, beloved, do this. But you, beloved, do this. Let me show you what I mean by that, starting in verse 17. But you, beloved, ought to remember the words that were spoken beforehand by the apostle of our Lord Jesus, by the apostles, plural, of our Lord Jesus Christ. He says that we need to remember what the word of God says. Not only the apostles, but the words of Jesus, the words of the prophets. Um, the best way to remember, and I'm discovering this more and more, is not to rely on my own memory. <laughs> okay. uh, but instead to be reminded daily as I read God's words. That's how we remember what God wants us to know. Reading the words of Jesus, reading the words of the apostles, reading the words of the prophets, all recorded for us in the word of God, the Bible. So that's one of the ways that we contend faithfully. That's one of the ways that we focus intentionally on standing firm in the faith and winning this battle for righteousness and truth, etc. Second one is this. In verse 20 and 21, there's that phrase again, but you, beloved, he repeats that phrase to signal to you, pay attention to this. This is what I want you to be doing. Building yourselves up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit, Keep yourselves in the love of God, looking forward to the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to eternal life. And so the command, there's a single command in these verses here, and it says, keep yourselves in the love of God. That's what he's telling us to do. And if you look carefully, you'll see he tells us how to do it. And the way that we know how to do this command is we look for something called participles. Participles, if you remember back to when you were in school, you learned that a participle is a helping word or a helping verb. It ends with I-N-G. Then there are three of them here in this verse. These are, there's one command and there's three participles and each participle shows us how to keep ourselves in the love of God. You tracking with me on that so far? There, a little English lesson. My daughter would be proud. She's an English art, uh, language arts teacher. Okay, number one, we do this by building ourselves up in our most holy faith. Building, there's the first part of the See the I-N-G? That's pointing to how to keep ourselves in the love of God. Building means this. We're not satisfied with how things are right now. Anybody who's ever built something or tried to build something begins with a dissatisfaction of the way that things are right now. Things can be better. So I'm going to do something about it. I'm going to build something to try. I'm going to try to build something to try to make things better. Spiritually, sometimes it's easier to do than in other ways, unless you're like Jim over here who, who knows how to do this kind of thing. So we're not satisfied with where we are right now. Spiritually, we realize that there's more. And so we make a commitment to becoming spiritually stronger. And, it, and uh, it, with, without, without, excuse me, without commitment, there's no improvement. That's where you start. You start with a commitment. I want to grow. I want to be better. I want to be more like Jesus. That's, that's where he's beginning in this verse. And then he also says the next thing is praying. Prayer. Prayer is talking with God. And in this context, the idea here is if you want to grow spiritually, talk to God about it. If you want to grow spiritually, you need a coach. And the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, 
It's your spiritual coach, divine coach, who lives within you. He is always with you. And he will help you at any time talk to God about anything, especially what it takes for you to remain in and keep ourselves in the love of God. And so the Spirit of God gave us our relationship with God. He gives us a capacity to talk with God. And here's the point. If you're not praying, you're not growing. You need to be praying. You have to. You're not going to grow without it. Here's the third one. Looking forward. Looking forward to the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to eternal life. Catch this. Weaker Christians look backward. Weaker Christians look to the past. Stronger Christians, growing Christians, look ahead. They look forward. Struggling Christians are anchored to their past failures, and we all have them. But when we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to um, cleanse, that's the word, cleanse us. See, my memory thing. Cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Thanks, John. Yeah. And once you've been cleansed, you know, don't jump back into the pig pen again. Don't go there. It's, it's over. It's done. You've been forgiven. You've been washed. You're clean. You, you turn from it, learn from it, but don't go back to it. And so a, a weaker Christian lives in the past. A thriving Christian looks ahead and anticipates a better future, uh, knowing that, you see in this verse, that God is rich in mercy. He's rich in mercy. God forgives our sins. He overlooks our failures once they've been confessed. So should we. That's how you keep yourself in the love of God. God anticipates an eternal reunion, and so should we. Looking forward, looking forward. All this takes focused effort. That it means to earnestly contend. Here's what we're to be engaged in, in doing. This is it. There's these words like faith and praying and love and mercy and eternal life. These are all the things God offers to us. And it's rich. As you can see, he's given to us every resource we need to stay in the love of God, to remain spiritually strong, spiritually pure. Here, I think, is the best part of Jude. Final couple of verses. Now to him who is able, we're going to sing about that in just a minute. He is able. Now to him who is able to protect you from stumbling and to make you stand in the presence of his glory. Think about this. Blameless. With great joy. The only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. This verse begins with us, but it's about God. Here's all the things that God's going to do for us, but that is not the focus. <laughs> the focus is on God and who he is and what he's going to do. And so we need to keep that in mind. So what God wants to do in your life, he will do. But it's a cooperative effort. You can't just sit back on autopilot and expect God to do all of his responsibilities, uh, we need to put in some effort as well to contend earnestly. And that's why these three commands we just looked at earlier, these two commands actually earlier with those three participles, precede this doxology. You can do this because of who God is. You can do this because of who God is. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the way that you love us. We thank you that in the scriptures we see who you want us to be and what you want us to do. And all of that is rooted in who you are and what you've already done, what you're doing now, what you will do in the future. So, Father, we know in many places in the scriptures we see this principle, this command to get our eyes off of ourself and to look at you. And uh, <clears throat> I hope that we understand that. I hope that we learn more and more day by day how to do that. And Jude's given us some really practical things to do. 
but we can't do it without your help. And so that's how we want to begin today when we sing. Just focus on your ability, your capacity, who you are as God. We want to celebrate who you are as God as we sing. So we thank you in advance for how you will be speaking to us even as we're singing to you, Father. Thank you for this kind of relationship that you've made available to us. As we mentioned, through your spirit, who lives within us as our spiritual life coach. We thank you for his presence among us. Thank you for his ministry. Thank you for the strength of his power that enables us to be who you want us to be so that we can do what you want us to do so that you would be honored, you would be glorified, people would see you, people would come to you, people would find life in you through Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Okay, let's say goodbye to our Facebook friends. Okay.